Hey, it's Coach Scheller. If you are locked at home right now, like I am, then I'm assuming you're looking for ways to push your game forwards um, with pretty limited resources. Most of the gyms are closed at this point. The gyms that are still open are potentially unsafe to train at. And so because of that, our team has poured over our library of training videos here at EGT and pulled out 21 of our best at-home training strategies for every single skill in your game. And before we jump into those videos, I wanted to mention that um, the reason we chose 21, which is a big number, this is gonna be a huge, huge video, is we wanted to prove that you actually can train every skill in your game at home, including your jump shot, and that's even if you don't have a hoop. So there really is no excuse to not continue working on your game and pushing it forwards during this time. Again, it's not gonna be exactly the same as having a gym, of course, but we can get some serious work done, as you'll see. So we're gonna run through all of these videos, and I also wanted to mention that our team also put together a complete at-home training program for you for just five bucks. We're giving it away during this time because as you know, we only get so many off seasons and we can't afford to waste an entire off season locked at home, stuck on the couch watching Netflix like most players probably will. So if you wanna take advantage this time, I really strongly suggest clicking through, the, the link will be somewhere around this video. Click through, check out that program. Again, it's just five bucks today, no strings attached. And uh, we really, really can't wait to get that into your hands because it will really help you out, okay? So let's run through all of these videos now. Also, um, you're going to notice that we may have posted some of these in the past. So some of these will be a repost. Some of these have never been posted before. Either way, uh, the ones you've seen before, watch them again. Try those drills again. And I really think that you're going to get a ton out of this. Okay, so let's jump into them now and we will see you on the other side. Hey guys, it's Coach Damon. We get a lot of questions about how can you work on your shot without a hoop and at your house. Now a lot of you want to spend time at home in your bedroom or in your basement working on your game, but obviously that's not somewhere where you can actually have a hoop so you can't work on your shot. It may be difficult to work on game moves, attacking downhill, anything like that, but you can still become a better player. You can still work on tiny micro skill aspects of your game, even with very, very minimal space. So today we're gonna to bring you through an entire series where you can work on your shot, you can work on your mechanics while you are in your bedroom or while you are downstairs, where all you're gonna need is a chair and a tiny little bit of space to work with. So we're gonna start very simply, and in his chair, all he's gonna do is he's gonna have the ball in his shooter's pocket, he's gonna shoot, and he's gonna hold his follow through until he catches the ball with his off hand. So he's here, he follows through, elbow above his eyes, and he's gonna catch. Now our focal point here is to work on our follow through. A lot of guys struggle with their follow through and they drop it too quickly or it's side to side. So as he follows through and watch with his shot, he's gonna hold it when he catches. He's gonna give himself constant feedback, making sure every time that he's following through the exact same way. So it's almost like he's doing a deep dive or an analysis of his own follow through. So every catch, he's seeing that with him, it's that middle finger. Every time it's middle finger down, catch. He's making sure it's there. He's analyzing that follow through. Let's get five more. And catch. Seeing that follow through, seeing what it looks like every single time. Last one, great catch. A lot of times the biggest distraction for shooters or guys who are trying to become great shooters is the basket. If you're trying to work on your mechanics and you get in the gym, a lot of times it becomes very easy to only worry about whether the shot goes in regardless of whether or not your mechanics are correct. By working on a drill like this, your mechanics are the only thing that you can do so that you have to make sure in that analysis that they are correct. So now we're here. We're going two hands, catch, and that catch is gonna be getting right back into his shot pocket. So we're repping out, shot, and then catch. He's gonna have a split second hold, shot, and when he catches it, it's quickly gonna to get to that shot pocket. So it's here, shot pocket. Here, quick to the shot pocket. Here, quick to the shot pocket. Great job, quick to the shot pocket. Great job, and what we wanna to try to avoid right now is shooting it in front and then just looping it back. When I catch it, I'm pulling it to my shot pocket. I don't want to shoot and let it fall. It's shot, catch, 
shot pocket. Here we go. Shot pocket, great job. Shot pocket, there it is. Great job. Great job. When you catch the ball in the game, you're catching it and getting into that pocket as quickly as you can. You're not letting it get all the way here and just catching it in that pocket. So here we're working on catching it and getting it into that pocket. Now our next drill in the series, you're gonna to wanna to do in the basement or somewhere with a hardwood floor. And all you're gonna do is dribble and we're gonna work on our pickups straight into the same shot that we started with. So our focus is our pickup and doing an analysis of that follow through, making sure that if we do one dribble pull ups or we do anything with a move and a pickup, that doesn't affect our follow through. So we're here, two, pick up. Still wanna catch with that offhand. Here, catches offhand, sticks that follow through. One, two, pick up. Catches, there we go, great job, let's get two more. Great job, there it is, last one. Great work. Now the very last one in the series is we're gonna slide up on the edge of the chair and we're either gonna go underneath our legs, simulating it behind the back, or you can go through your legs, similar to between the legs. And we're gonna to build to the final stage of that series where it's pick up out of a move, shot, stick the follow through, catch with your off hand. He's gonna do two each way, pick up, stick it. Yep, move, pick up, stick it. Great job, move, pick up. Let's get one more, sticking that follow through, catching it off hand. Great job. Now in each of those, the focal points are those tiny little micro skills. We wanna work on our follow through. Well, let's shoot and look at our follow through every single time. We wanna work on our pickup and make sure that doesn't impact the follow through after the pickup. It's the exact same thing. So while you may not be able to get shots up at the basket, you may not be able to go hard and work up a tremendous sweat, work like this can be tremendously beneficial if you're limited on space, you're trying to get in a little bit of work, and you're on that path to becoming an elite shooter. Hey guys, it's Coach Allen with the Elite Jump Training Program. Uh, one of the questions I get from players all over the world is how can I improve the range on my shot? Now improving your range is actually twofold. A portion is actually handled in the weight room and becoming stronger. When you become stronger, it's like putting a bigger engine in a car. But equally important is your mechanics, the, the, the technical way in which you shoot the basketball. Because the more efficient you are with your form, the more range you'll be able to have. Since we're in the weight room today, all we'll focus on is that strength portion. I also know that a lot of you watching this that have this question, you're younger. And when you're younger, you haven't built the requisite strength yet. So I'm gonna show you a few different exercises, one for our pushing muscles, one for our pulling muscles, and one for our legs and hips. And I'm gonna give you a couple of progressions that you can do for each one, so you can start to build the strength you need to then take that to the court, apply it to your skills and form to add range to your shot. The very first thing we do will be a push-up. And we're gonna start and do a modified push-up, a kneeling version of the push-up, where we're actually gonna have our knees on the floor instead of our feet. So let's go ahead and get eight perfect kneeling push-ups. There's nothing wrong with having to start at this level. So we're gonna go ahead and flatten out your hips, yep, and go ahead and let's get eight perfect reps. When you can do 10 to 12 perfect reps like this, then you'll be able to graduate to a normal push-up but your form and technique is by far the most important. And perfect, now let's just go ahead to regular push-up so we can get rid of the mat. Take a breath if you need it, and then we'll go ahead and do regular push-ups. Excellent. Once you can do 10 to 12 regular push-ups, our last portion of the advanced series of this movement would be to put your toes on the bench and put your hands on the ground. All right, let's see if we can get six to eight of these. Nice. Excellent. So now that we've worked the front side of our body, we want to make sure we have balance and we work the back side as well. So now we're going to go to our pulling movements. Uh, for most of you watching, if you are younger players and you find regular pull-ups really challenging, that's okay. We're going to do what's called a modified row. And I realize this may be hard if you're doing these at home. These might be something you have to do at your school or gym, but we want to find something right around waist height. So go ahead and hop in here and we're going to take an underhand grip and we're going to do a set of modified rows. 
The first modification, you're gonna put your feet underneath your knees. No, yep, just like that. And you're gonna pull your chest to the bar. Yep, excellent. Let's just see if we can get six of these. So this is modified row version number one. When you can do 10 to 12 of these, then we'll go ahead and straighten your legs all the way out. Yep, same thing. Same grip you had, because you can still go underhand, yep. Just get four to six of these. Excellent. All the way up, looks good. Nice. Excellent, and relax. Once you're able to do the modified row, now we'll actually have you hop inside and let's get one set of pull-ups. Let's just see if we can get four to six pull-ups. You can grab any grip that you'd like, underhand or neutral grip. Yep. <laughs> now we want to make sure we move to our lower body. We want to strengthen everything from the lower body. A lot of players don't realize that a good portion of your power when you shoot the ball comes from your lower body. So the first one we'll do, we'll have you come here and we're just gonna get in a split stance and you're just gonna drop back knee to the ground and then go straight up. So you can go ahead and hop on this side and why don't we just get six each side. Just straight down, straight up. Yep. Excellent. Yep, same thing other side, that's perfect. Now our next level of this will be, we'll start in an athletic stance and we'll actually drop one leg back into a reverse lunge. We'll get six in a row on one side and six in a row on the other. Yep, perfect. Excellent. John. And our highest level of progression would be a rear foot elevated split squat, where we'll actually put the instep of our foot on top of the bench, and we'll get a rear foot elevated split squat. Last one, let's just get four each side. Yep. You probably noticed that those were fairly basic exercises, but if you want to be a great player, you can't get bored with the basics. You need to be able to master these movements before you graduate up and do some more traditional weight training exercises. So once you can do the advanced version of the push-up, the pull-up, and the rear foot elevated split squat, then you'll be able to tackle that more conventional program. And all of these, even the most basic ones, will still help you add range to your shot. What's up guys, it's Coach Drew, and today I'm gonna to help you guys improve your shot if you don't have access to a basket. So many times people slide my DMs and they'll say, hey Coach Drew, I'm really struggling getting better at shooting because I don't have access to a facility or a basket. Now the truth is, the majority of the time, there is an outdoor court that that player could go seek out and try to improve on that, but if they don't wanna do that, there's still a ton of different ways to improve at home. After all, the most important thing when shooting is confidence and making sure that you have consistent reps every single time. And so if you have the ability to kind of pull yourself away from the basket, sometimes it actually helps improve your mechanics because you're not worried about the result of the ball going in and you're more worried about the process of making it look right and feel right and be right every single time. So I actually, a lot of times when I'm breaking down shots, I will kind of restrict the player from shooting on a rim so they're not discouraged by misses and they so just focus on the process of getting better. So let's talk about how you can get better if you don't have have a rim. The first thing is just make sure that the ball is spinning properly. So you want your hand in the middle of the ball, maybe your balance hand on the side, and just shoot it up to yourself. If you see the ball spinning here, you know, okay, the ball's spinning this way, which means it's not rolling the right way. 
So just get good backspins to yourself right here. You know, you've seen people shoot when they're laying down in their bed. I like when you're standing up because you're gonna be standing up when you're shooting in a game and just work on just the perfect backspin every single time. If you can't, if the ball's spinning in the wrong direction, then go to the three finger drill. So what you do is you tuck these two fingers down, put these two fingers right where the air hole is, and now you just work on snapping the ball like this. You'll notice that what happens is it's training your body to let these two fingers be the last two fingers off the ball when you're shooting it. So now you just do the three finger drill, and again, you notice tight, perfect backspin every single time. Once we have the backspin down, maybe it's the balance hand that's messing you up, okay? So maybe you're right here, and you're really thumbing it, maybe you're pushing it. Now it's not terrible, a lot of great shooters, you know, use their balance hand thumb, but if it's putting side spin or unwanted kind of weird spin on the ball, then it's something we're gonna wanna change. So then you work on the release timing. So now what we do is we get it to our pocket, and as we start to go up, we just release our finger pads, have a flat hand, and then shoot it. So again, now we're going up, we go one, two, three, and kind of go slow motion so that we understand one, our hand's still on the ball, two, our hand is kind of open, three, our hand comes off the ball, but it's not pulling in a direction that's gonna alter our shoulders because we wanna stay on balance at all times. So one, two, three, every single time. One, two, three, every single time. So that's a great way to work on your balance hand, just making sure that every single time it's not guiding the ball, it's just right there every single time. Another thing you gotta do is work on your rhythm. So a lot of people struggle with the rhythm. So the rhythm is gonna be easy. All you're gonna do is when you drop down, your elbow is gonna start circling under the ball. So if I'm right here, as I drop down, my elbow's coming under the ball. Drop down, elbow's coming under the ball. And then once I get up to the top, all I wanna do is I wanna be on my tippy toes when the ball hits kind of the, the perfect spot where you wanna start to release. So it's right here, ball goes down, ball goes up, and then I would ultimately shoot it from there. So ball goes down, ball goes up. And if you're struggling, say you're rolling off of one direction instead of rolling equally off both feet, then what you do is a simple drill where you just go backwards and then forwards and roll. So I'd go right here, backwards, and then forward. Going here, backwards, and forward. Right here, backwards, and forward. So again, a ton of different ways that you can work on your shot. And the other thing you can do is you can actually work on reps. Say you have a wall right there, you can pass it to yourself, catch it, and work on shooting. Say you're working on dribble pickups, you can work on letting the ball hang, hezzy pull-ups, you can work on push out, getting good pickups, you can work on step back, working on good pickups into your pocket and then get clean shots because so much of the shot is all about the preparation and the mechanics and if you master those, once you get on a rim, it'll be easy just to get reps and ultimately get that confidence going so that when it comes game times, you'll make more shots. Hey guys, this is Coach Allen, and Coach Christian and I are going to take you through an at-home vertical jump workout. Awesome guys, before we even begin to maximize our jumping ability, we have to ensure that our landing mechanics are appropriate and optimized, right? I will do this drill here probably about five reps, three rounds, two to three times a week depending on where you're at in your cycle, right? As I'm stepping on here, I want to ensure that my hands and my hips are in the appropriate position as I'm landing. So as I step off, I'm ensuring that my hips are loaded back behind me and my hands are throwing back. We'll see and understand why as this drill continues to progress. But again, as I'm stepping off, soft bend in the knees and my hands are throwing back right as I contact here with the ground, right? How high should the box be? The box, really over time, that's a great way to kind of progress yourself, right? As the box continues to get higher, there's higher amounts of forces, there's more amount of stability that your body needs to be able to build so that we don't have, right, as I step off, I don't have an earthquake. Every single time we make contact with the ground, our body, lower body and upper body is both super stable. Perfect, and I know we're on an artificial turf here. What's the ideal surface to land on? For a basketball player, if we wanna to try to mimic the game as much as we can, let's get into a flat surface that does not have any type of turf. Something that has uh, the same type of feedback like a court would have. Perfect. Right now, as we progress, we start to get a little bit better, we can easily increase the box, right? A simple way to increase. But if we're looking for another drill to still stay at the same height, now we're gonna add an actual plow metric in the jumping aspect, right? So as I'm now landing, I'm going here to the ball of my foot. So now my heels are coming off the ground. My hands are still in the same ready position, but now I'm building the ankle stiffness at a specific angle, an angle that we jump off of on a very common basis, right? So again, stepping off, hips back, my belly and my core is nice and tight as my heels are slightly here off the ground. 
And this is the second part of the progression. This is, this is the second part of the progression. The first part would be feet flat. Second part would be onto the ball of the foot, not the tippy toes, the ball of the foot. And then the last portion is actually adding the jump in, right? So as I'm now here, this is where the hands become very important. My hands are already gonna start to toss back, hop on up, and then once I make that first contact, I'm minimizing the amount of time that I'm on the ground. I wanna get up rather than jumping horizontally. Again, I'll step off, hands back, still sticking that second landing. Again, I would complete about five reps. If you get to rep number four or five and you're very fatigued, then by all means, take some time off, let your body recover, and let's get at least three sets in of solid reps every single time. So five reps of the flat foot landing, yep. fly foot, uh, five reps of heel slightly up, mm -hmm. and then five reps of the actual jump. Exactly. That would be one set, go through that three times. Exactly. Perfect. Exactly. Awesome. So once you get done with those three progressions right there, the next thing that we're going to get into is a non-counter movement jump. A lot of us, right, in basketball are very used to utilizing the stretch before we come up and produce force. But what we need to get better at if we want to become a better jumper is utilizing the jump without using the stretch. So what does that look like? I got my feet here in this ready position. I'm gonna set my hips back and put my hamstrings on a nice tight amount of tension. From there, I got my hands back, so I'm loaded. As I jump here, I don't wanna bend and drop anymore using it for a stretch. This is my back position. I'm now gonna utilize my ankles to get up and then stick that landing. Again, very important. Many of us are used to loading and then jumping right away. Let's pause for a second. Let's build tension here for three seconds, utilize the ankles, and then get back down. Again, we're thinking about five reps here, taking enough time in between each rep. If you're breathing heavily, take some time to rest. Five reps, three rounds, doing this about two to three times a week. Love it. And then how about something from a strength standpoint? Do you have a strength movement you'd like to do? 100%, 100%. Cool. So now what we're gonna utilize is now we're gonna start utilizing the stance, the split stance, right? A lot of the basketball game is played in this split stance or on a single leg. So what we're gonna utilize here is just my one leg. If I can maximize how well and how efficient one leg is jumping and landing, then I'm gonna go ahead and make sure that's gonna help me ensure that my two feet jump or my single leg jump is gonna be maximized. So I'm here, this heel is up, the majority of my weight is in my front foot, I'm gonna load back again into this uh, tight position for my backside. Now as I'm here, my arms are tight, my hamstrings are tight, I take off, land. And again, 90 to 95% of the weight is still here in this single leg, okay? Then up, load, up, land. Again, I'm thinking five reps on one leg, same thing, five reps on the next leg, and we're thinking three rounds here of these movements two to three times a week. So do you want them, when we have the first progression that has the three parts, do you yeah. want them to do all of that first and then move to number two and number three, or kind exactly. of do it in a circle, okay. Exactly, so you would can finish your three rounds for the first three progressions, Yep. then move into your non-counter movement jumps for yep. three rounds, and then you would finish the last three rounds with this split stance right here. Gotcha, and we're doing this uh, in season, off season, when are, when are we incorporating this in? Yeah. Really the best time to do it is off season, early off season, right? But of course, a great way to not load up the joints and tissue so much is doing the non-counter movement jumps, so the stuff that does not have a stretch, that actually be great for in season. Still wanting to maximize your jumping ability, but not having to produce as much force and as much wear and tear on the joints and soft tissue. And then last question, if they're doing some more traditional strength work, squats and deadlifts, do you do this before or would you rather them do this after? Yeah, great question. I would say a lot of the landing stuff is great to do right before for, yeah. right before your workout because you're, you're uh, acclimating your body to high amounts of forces and also a lot of, a lot of stability. Right? When we get under a bar, when we're lifting a lot of weight, that's usually what we are lacking, appropriate amounts of stability. Now the, the plow metric aspect, the quick jump, the quick reaction stuff, that could be greatly inputted in between your heavy lifts yep. and your heavy sets, but just again, always ensuring because the quality of the outputs are always there, that our rest times are, are taken into account and we do have enough rest. We can still hold a conversation and not be breathing heavily. Love it. Well, there you go, guys. There's a at-home vertical jump workout that you can interject in and around the rest of your training program uh, to improve your hops and improve your bounce any time of year. Hey guys, it's Coach Allen with the Elite Jump Training Program, and I want to show you five of my favorite body weight exercises for improving lower body strength and power and vertical jump. The very first one we'll do will be a simple body weight squat, except we want to get some tempo going. So we'll start in a good athletic stance, but we want to get it going 
at a good pace. So we want to get some explosiveness in this movement. Let's go ahead and see if we can get 15 of those as quick as possible. Yep. Nice. That's it. Fast, fast, fast. Explode. Good. Nice. That's perfect. Excellent. Now we want to take it from going kind of that pistol type squat. Now we want to go to our knee tucks. So we're going to add an explosive component. So we're still going into the squat, but then we're going to explode up and tuck knees to chest. Let's get six knee tucks. Explode up. Yep. Perfect. Right to it. Yep. One fluid motion. There you go. That looks good. Two more. Excellent. Now to ensure that we're working each leg independently, we're going to do a set of split squats. So we're going to go from a split stance, vertically jump, and switch legs in place. So then this time he'll land with his right foot in front. So let's get six vertical jump uh, from a split stance. That's it. Go for height. Get up even higher. Throw those hands up. There you go. Good. Yep. Excellent. The next one we'll do, we're going to do an explosive step up. So we'll have one leg on the bench, going to drive hard through this leg, drive this other knee up as explosive as possible. So the foot on top may even leave the bench for two to three inches. All right, let's get uh, six in each direction. Explode up as high as possible. Yep, there you go. Drive up. That's okay. Drive up. There you go. Good. Think like you're jumping. Don't worry so much with your hands as if you were trying to literally try and touch the ceiling jumping off your right foot. Yes, that's it. Good. Yes. Once you feel like you got it down, just switch sides. That looks great. Nice job. That's it. Explode. And the last one we'll do will be a set of box jumps. And in this case, we'll use the bench. So we're going to explode up to land on. And then we got to make sure we control that impact and dissipate that force on the way down. So we're simply just going to jump up as soon as we touch right back up. Let's get eight of those quick and explosive. That's it. Excellent. And those are five of my favorite body weight exercises for improving your vertical jump and lower body strength. Hey guys, it's Coach Allen with the Elite Jump Training Program and I want to show you three of my favorite core exercises for improving your vertical jump. When most people think of vertical jump, they simply think of training their legs and hips. Uh, and too many programs just focus on the calves. But if you really want to maximize your ability to be explosive, then you've got to train your core. Your core is the center of every movement you do when you jump. For the first one, we'll actually use a medicine ball and we're going to get in a good athletic stance. We're going to raise the ball up as high, get that full triple extension, and then going to slam the ball as hard as possible, getting a great follow through so that we engage those abs. So we're going to slam med ball slams as hard as possible. So let's go ahead and get five of those, hard as you can. Up high. Yep, there you go. Good. Hard as you can. Good. Beautiful. Nice. Two more. Boy, that's perfect. Awesome. That's it. Nice job. The next med ball exercise we'll do to help strengthen the core is we're going to hold the med ball outside of our right knee and we're going to swing it up and hold right above our left shoulder. So we're getting a swinging motion. We want to get some rotation incorporated in what we're doing and we're working the ability to again rotate but we're also strengthening our hips and our lower back. So we're going to hold the ball here, swing and hold, bring it down. Swing and hold. Let's get three going right to left and three going left to right. Hard as you can. Yep, and hold. Good. Nice. Yep, same thing, other knee. Explode. Good. Excellent. The last one we'll do, we don't need a med ball. We can just use some floor space. And we're going to alternate in a superhero fashion, opposite arm and opposite leg. This is great for not only strengthening triple extension, but more importantly, that posterior chain. So the player is going to get in a good push-up position, hands directly under shoulders, feet the same width as hands, and is going to lift one arm and one leg, hold for a second, and then switch. It takes tremendous stability, but we got to make sure that we keep everything in the core tight. 
Why don't we just try to get four each side, so eight total. Drop that butt down a little bit. There you go, now you're perfect. Yes. Excellent, boy, that's great. That's fine. Excellent. Excellent. Nice. Last one, that was it. Excellent. By training your core in a very specific manner, you'll make extra improvement to your ability to vertically jump. Hey, this is Coach Damon, and today we're going to bring you a basement ball handling series. A workout that you can literally do in your basement if you can't get to the gym, if your outdoor court is covered in snow, or if it's raining. You have a basement, you can do this workout. As you can see, we're filming it in the corner of a gym right here. So also, if you go to the YMCA, you go to Lifetime Fitness, you go anywhere, and you can't get a court, but you've got a corner, this is a workout you can do to improve your game, to improve your handle, without having a ton of space, and without actually having a gym or a basket. The great thing about basketball is you can get better anywhere that you have a ball. So we're gonna take this opportunity to give you a workout that you can do in your basement. You can work out on your own. You don't need a court, you don't need a basket. All you need is a little corner where you can dribble and you can get better. In this basement workout, we're gonna give you several different drills that are gonna to touch on different aspects of your game. We're gonna work on your conditioning. Even though it's stationary, even though you're in one spot, we're gonna give you ball handling that is gonna challenge your cardio. We're gonna work on game moves and footwork. We're also gonna finish because you've done a ton of ball handling and you're actually gonna get shot work even though you're in your basement. To get started, we're simply gonna burn out to get going, to get a great sweat going to work on our cardio. And I'm gonna go two ball alternating for three sets of 45 seconds. Three sets of 15 is tough if you go as hard as you can with this. You're gonna go three sets of 45. My hips are gonna be dropped, I'm gonna be in an athletic stance and I'm gonna pound the ball between my knee and my hip. If you're right here at the ground, you're not doing that right. You dribble the ball in the game between your knee and your hip. And that's where you're gonna dribble it as you burn out here. The ball is right off the pad of your hand and it's hard through. Dents in the floor, forearm wrist through the ball and it's just machine gun, alternate as quick as you possibly can go. So if I go through it live, I'm here, my hips are dropped and again, you've got three sets of 45 seconds and my eyes are up and I'm just alternating, quick. Ball through the floor, pound it out. Three sets, 45 seconds. Our second drill is still gonna be in that two ball series, but now we're gonna add footwork and we're gonna add a side jab where you're gonna work on creating space laterally. If I jab to the side and I shift that defense, I've created a driving lane in the opposite direction. So for my drill, my hips are gonna be dropped and as I alternate, I'm going boom, hard side jab, straight back together. Hard side jab, straight back together. And for three sets of 45 seconds, I'm here, side jab, here, side jab, here, side jab. Feet always come back together. That's me getting to square, that's me getting into my attack. And the jab is short, quick, and violent. I'm not just stepping side to side. I'm here and it's hard through the floor. So if I went through it live, I'm handling hard side jab, here, hard side jab, here, hard side jab, here, hard side jab. Short, quick, and violent, space creation laterally, driving lane in the opposite direction. Our next drill in our basement series are gonna be working on our cross drags. So we're gonna work on an attack move and we're gonna work on a counter that can get us into our shot. If I'm here and I attack out of a cross, I may cross and go to my outside foot, like with an Iverson crossover where I'm here, outside foot. If that's taken away, I need to be good enough to either drag back to space, counter back in the opposite direction, but there has to be some sort of counter that's in a different direction from where I started. So in our cross drag drill, I'm gonna cross and drag, and that's gonna be one rep. You're gonna get 10 of those. One, here, two, here, three. 10 reps each direction, three sets through. When you get started, you may need to add a dribble in between your cross and drag. Once you get your rhythm, you can just cross, drag, cross, drag, repping it out with no dribble. Make sure your hips stay dropped. Make sure that crossover is to the rim. It's taken away and I'm good enough to drag back. So if I were to go through a live, I'm here and I'm here, cross, drag. Take that dribble. Here, cross, drag. Take that dribble. Cross, drag. No dribble, cross, drag. No dribble, cross, drag. Hips are dropped. I'm forcing myself to make a mistake and now quick cross, drag. 
Move, counter, option. Next, we're gonna get into our slow to goes. Where we work on our change of pace game, where I'm slow, I see a high foot, defense falls asleep, and then I quickly explode and go. So I'm literally gonna be here and it's totally on you. You might take three dribbles in between, you might take one, you might take five. And then I'm quickly exploding through, whether it's a between, whether it's a cross, or if it's a drop and wrap behind. But in your slow to goes, the key is that you are slow. You're at zero. I'm not going anywhere downhill. And then all of a sudden I'm zero, boom, to 100, and I'm tacking the rim. So I'm here and I'm slow, I'm seeing the court, boom, quick. And then I'm straight back again. Slow here, boom, quick. And I'm straight back. I'm slow, 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 go. Slow to go. You're going 10 reps each direction, three sets through. This one isn't about getting the reps as quickly as you can. It's about game action, slow, change of pace, I attack. I kill him with a change of pace, I kill him with a change of speed, speeds kill, slow to go. With our next drill, we're gonna build out of the slow to goes and go to move to pick up. So now when I make moves, I've created space and I'm immediately gonna pick up into my shot. So this time I'm here and you can mix up your moves. You can go between, cross, behind. You can go three straight between, three straight cross. It's totally on you to determine that aspect of your workout. But I'm here, and this time when I'm slow, when I go, I'm immediately picking up and getting into my shot. So I'm here, I'm slow, I'm boom, 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 quick, straight to shot. I'm here, 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 quick, straight to shot. Whatever move I make, whether it's single, whether it's double, I'm always getting into my pickup. So if I go through it live, I'm here, boom, pick, pick up. Here, here, pick up. Move to pick up. Game move, create space, pick up, working on it all in your basement. Our next basement series drill, we're gonna work on changing levels. Great point guards can play high, they can play here, and they can play low. And your ability to change levels affects your ability to manipulate the defense. If you're always low, you're never really working hesitations and shot fakes with your dribble. If you're always high, you're never creating leverage. So if you're always at one or the other without an ability to play high to low, low to high, you're gonna be easy to guard. So we're going with rhythm scissors. And I'm gonna start with the live dribble and I'm going scissor, hesitate, through one. Hesitate, through two, hesitate, through one, hesitate. So every single time, when I go through, I'm low. When I hesitate, I'm high coming to that shot, letting the ball rise in my hand. Now, if you're struggling with this to get started, go one, two, and you can take a dribble in between. Once you've got your rhythm down, you wanna get rid of that rhythm and just let your ball rise as your body rises and explode through. So if I went through it, I'm here. One, two, rise, one. One, two, rise, one. One, two, rise, one. Two, one, two, one, drop low rise high, drop low, rise high with our rhythm series. Now that you've gone through all the sets and reps indicated, we're gonna finish with shooting. A lot of guys say, should I work out and lift before or after I shoot? At high levels, very good high schools and obviously college and NBA, guys always shoot after they lift to shoot off the lift. And that's nothing more than just going in and getting shot reps to find their form, find their mechanics when their arms are tired. What we're gonna do here, since everything was intense, everything was in one spot, you really burn out ball handling, we're gonna finish with shooting. And I'm gonna drop down on the floor, and I'm gonna start, and I'm showing simple one-handed form shots. And I got 50 here where I'm on my back, and I've got shot, hold, follow through. I want you to do the best job you can to hold your follow through until the ball comes back to your hand. Boom, here, hold, back, here, hold, back. I shouldn't have to move at all, as I snap and then catch straight back. You've got 50 of these. Your goal is to go 50 in a row without ever having one that you have to reach for. If you have to reach, you weren't true in your follow through. After we get our 50 with one hand, we're going 50 with a guide hand. But with a guide hand, I'm not gonna palm the ball. I'm going straight palm, so I'm just straight, again, working on that shot. Boom, shot. Notice my guide hand, for the most part, is just staying in one spot. It's just functioning as a guide. Stays in that one spot. Hold the follow through until the ball comes straight back to my hand. 50. 
So to finish this basement workout, you've got 100 form shots, snapping that wrist, sticking that follow through with your back on the ground, no feet, no shoulders, just straight wrist, form, follow through. Like we said at the beginning, you don't have to have much space at all to do this workout. It's designed to do in your basement when you can't get to the gym, if you're trying to get extra work in the morning or at night before you go to bed. But you can also do it in the corner of the gym if all the courts are filled with guys playing pickup. Or if you've got space at the end of the hallway and you, you have a ball with you, you're just trying to get a little bit of extra work. You can do this workout in minimal space. From ball handling burnout work, trying to develop quick and explosive handles to attack moves and counters, to rhythm and changing level and then finishing with shots. We're touching on a little bit of everything about your offensive game and you're doing it in your basement. Elite players don't make excuses, they always find a way. If you have space, if you have a ball, you can get better. And that's exactly what this works. Hey guys, it's Coach Damon. And we get a lot of questions about how can I work on my ball handling at home. And then to go a little bit further, we get questions about how can I work on my handle at home without actually dribbling the basketball. Now the great thing about this series is we're going to show you is you can do this in your bedroom, you can do this in the kitchen or downstairs, and even if your parents don't let you dribble the ball or you don't have a place to dribble the ball in your house, you can do these drills. So we're going to start very simply, and it was Wayne's going to demonstrate, and you're going to see he's just going to go here. And all we're trying to do is get a feel of the ball. Now with a lot of these drills, they're going to seem very simple, and they're not necessarily game-like in that you're working on your handle where you're making moves, but we're just getting to feel the ball. We're making our wrists stronger. We're making our fingertips stronger. Then as you get comfortable, you're up and back, up and back. You're good. So we're just getting a little feel. We're just going to go for a minute, and it's going to be our warm-up. Now our next drill, and you're going to see Wayne demonstrate it, is he's going to stagger his feet a little bit. And this is going to be literally all the space that you're going to need for this entire series. Hips are going to be dropped, and as opposed to just going standard one leg wraps, he's going to go right, waist, left, waist. Right, waist, left, waist. Now he's going to try to go as quickly as he can to try to force himself to lose the ball. Leg, waist, leg, waist. Leg, waist, leg, waist. Now he's going to try to speed it up and go even quicker. Even quicker. Now change direction. Challenge himself to go the opposite direction. There you go. Quick hands. Stop. Now our next drill. Feet are going to be together and he's going to corkscrew. So he's going to go legs, waist, head, waist, legs. As quickly as he can go. He's around all three. Legs, waist, head. head. There we go. There you go. Waist, legs, waist, head. There you go. Opposite direction. Go. Great job, now speed it up. Great job, now you're here. We're gonna start and our legs are again gonna be together and we're gonna go both, single, both, single. Where each time we're stepping backwards with that foot. So we're here, double, single, double, single, double, single, double, single, there you go, there you go. Double, single, double, and single, there it is, there it is. There it is, opposite direction, go. Great job, double, single. Great job, great job. Now we're here, going away from ball wraps. All we're doing is going to ball slams, just like I'm sure you've done when you were a little kid. Ball slams here. And you wanna to try to smack the ball so that you hear it echoing, just like in the here, just like you can hear in the gym. Hard slams. Now hikes, so he's going to face forward, I'm going to face side to side, so he's going to face the camera, yep, perfect. Ball's going to be here, and if you struggle with this to start, you have to give it a little bounce, that's fine, but we want to try to catch, toss, catch, toss, catch, toss, catch. Notice hips are dropped, there you go. There it is, now speed it up. One hand in front, one behind. Great job. Great job, great job. Now our last one. We're gonna go one leg in front. Now if you need to start by putting one knee on the ground to do this, that's totally fine. But we're gonna eventually get to the point where that knee is off the ground. So we're gonna have one leg in front. The opposite hand, we're gonna start with the ball here. We're gonna to toss, catch. Right back, toss, catch. Right back, so I'm tossing, catching. Let's see it, ready, toss, there you go. There you go, this one's tough. There you go, flip right back. Ready, flip right back. There it is. There it is, Try opposite leg. Opposite hand, opposite leg. Quick flip, great job. Quick flip, great job.
Quick flip, there it is. There it is. There it is. There it is. Now we're here. Our next drill in the series. We're actually gonna work on our moves without ever taking a dribble while working on a move and then getting to our shot pocket. So we're gonna start square just like if in a game we had a live dribble. So I'm here and I'm gonna go through the legs. We're through, shot pocket. Through, shot pocket. So just like in a game, if I were to drop, make that move and then quickly shoot, I'm gonna rep that out. Through, shot pocket. Through, shot pocket. Through, shot pocket. Feet to square, let's see it. Through, shot pocket. There you go. Four, five, we'll switch directions. Pick up, pick up. Great job, great job. Now with all of these drills, I know some of them may seem very simple, but if you wanna find a way to get better in your house and you're unable to shoot and you're unable to dribble, you can have a ball in your hand and work on your wrist strength, work on your forearm strength, work on your hands and your fingers. And these drills are doing exactly that. You're gonna do each of them for 45 seconds to a minute in each direction and with each hand, and you've got yourself a 10 minute workout that you can do literally anywhere in your house. Hey guys, Coach Tim here. I wanna to talk to you guys about just finding three simple ball handling drills that you guys could do at your house and just within maybe a five to seven foot frame, um, whether it's in your garage, in the front yard, this is gonna allow you to be able to work on your, your hand speed, your foot speed, and really be able to develop uh, just a sense of confidence in any uh, go-to move for you. So one thing I like to do to start off with my, my, my guys is just working on nailing at least one foot in the ground. So it's a little bit of a, a, a movement in terms of my hips, swing, wherever the ball's going. I wanna try to work on shifting that defender east to west and getting them out of his stance. So simply what we'll do is I'll go ahead and now nail my right foot. And as this ball's going to my left, I'm swinging into the direction of the ball. So we'll go with a nice one, two, We'll go with an inverted step, right back. One, two, step. And then we can work on our speeds. But notice my shoulders are staying down and I'm working on staying low with my reach. You'll hear me say this a lot about staying low. And one of the important factors of it is, is if I could learn how to stay in a defensive stance while I dribble, my reach is normally gonna be lower than my knees. If I can maintain this as I'm going downhill while I'm attacking towards the basket or attacking the defender, I'm always going to be able to maintain my reach nice and low, which is going to allow me to get to the ball, to that hand a lot quicker, making me a little bit more shiftier. As opposed to if my arms are up, or my shoulders are up, I got a shorter reach. Now the distance between the floor and my hand is, is a lot longer and therefore allows the defender to recover. So make sure as you're doing this, you're swaying your hips. I'm staying low and I could just alternate my footwork. So I'm going left, right, Inverted step, okay, I'm going right back, making sure that my chin is up and I can speed up accordingly. So that's one drill you guys could do in the garage or just right there in, in your front yard, in the street, wherever you want. Just work on making sure that you're alternating your steps, swinging your hips, going side to side, wherever the ball's going, your body's going. The next drill I like to do just while I'm at home is just working on your pace. So going slow to fast with your ball handling and simultaneously trying to maintain your footwork. So similar to salsa dancing, as I'm dribbling, I wanna just dance to the rhythm of the bounce. So if my feet are moving, the ball's moving, I could do some type of variation and I'm just bouncing and I'm just working in tight spots. And then from this level, I'm starting high, I'm gonna break down nice and low and change my speeds with that dribble. So I may be high, High, quick down, low, high, high, break down, tap, 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 high, keep bouncing, footwork and up, okay, and my feet, notice my feet, don't stop, I'm moving, shift, keep them moving, and this will also help build up your endurance, you could go four or five reps at, at 30 seconds or a little bit longer than that, it's up to you, but this is a great way to stay in shape, just taking 15, 20 minutes out of your day to focus on some of these stationary ball handling moves will help you stay sharp going into your games. And lastly, one of the third stationary ball handling drills you could do at home is just simply just working a different variation of, of crossovers into a, in between the legs. So what I like to do is just kind of start out in a stagnant position. Once again, wherever that ball is going, I want to work my shoulders and my hips, just rocking it, maybe going 10 times through my left, switching it back up, going to my right, and I'm gonna just slowly just progress out of this. 
So I'm going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, then I'm gonna wrap one, two, three, four. Tap, tap, and notice my level. I'm going high to low, high to low. Now I can switch. Tap, tap, one, two, one, two. Just trying to find that nice rhythm. And then from that, I'm gonna build through a crossover, drop through, crossover, drop through, crossover. Okay, and going back to your 10, rule of 10. I typically wanna try to raise my level, drop through with a nice little pace, going between each legs, high to low, up, switch, then I can go tap, tap, switch. One, two, quick cross through. One, two, quick cross through. Outside of that, be creative on how you, you articulate your dribbles. So what I mean by that is I could go front side, I could go back side. So now I could go cross through behind, cross through behind, cross right here, same thing. One, two, wrap, spin out. One, two, three, spin out. What that's gonna do is that's gonna work on your hand speed. Not just your hand speed, but your foot speed. It's extremely important to, to make sure that our base is always staying wide, hips down, shoulders down to maintain that long reach. And just being able to stay fresh, going into your team practice, or just like I said, developing some type of game routine to be able to stay tight with your handles, just to give you confidence moving forward. Hey guys, it's Coach Allen, and I wanna share with you some exercises, uh, and more importantly, some overarching concepts of how you can improve your balance as a basketball player. Uh, I'm of the opinion that balance is one of the, the most underrated and least talked about components of basketball athleticism. Uh, but every single skill that you perform in the game, especially the skill of shooting, uh, goes way up when you're under control, you have the spatial awareness and proprioception to be on balance. Because the game is so chaotic and you're always running and jumping and moving through all three planes of motion, being able to get in and stay in a position of balance is really, really important. So I'm gonna show you a few exercises now that, that you can really do anywhere, and uh, some of them will be done as normal, and then some of them will actually remove the shoes to heighten the difficulty level and to make it uh, more difficult to balance, and then the third progression will be we'll do some of them with our eyes closed. Uh, when you try these at home, uh, you'll see that as soon as we remove one of your senses, it makes everything else work in overdrive. So the very first thing we'll do, we'll go ahead and pick up the plate, and if you don't have a plate, you could be holding a basketball, you could be holding a book, you could hold anything that gives you just a little bit of resistance. And we're just gonna balance on one leg, and I want you to raise your knees so it's higher than your waist, and I want you to get full extension with your arms. Ideally, we would hold this for anywhere from 30 to 60 seconds, uh, but certainly for the nature of this video, we won't need to do that, so we'll hold everything for 10 to 15, and then you can go ahead and switch sides, same thing, other side. We want to make sure that you cock your foot so toes to nose. We want to have knee higher than the waist and we want to have toes to nose so we're in a ready position. Uh, in basketball it's important to be ready in case you don't have time to get ready. Now let's go back to the original side and raise up and then just close your eyes. You can see just by eliminating sight that it's already causing his ankle, knee and foot to work into overdrive which makes it Harder and more challenging, but that was the goal. And go ahead and switch sides, that's perfect. Same thing, once you're set, you can close your eyes. That's perfect. And go ahead and put it down, and why don't you go ahead and slip your shoes off, and we're gonna do the exact same thing with no shoes. Uh, basketball shoes by design are to create as much stability as possible. Uh, so in order to improve, uh, to improve our stability and improve the strength uh, of the musculature in our feet uh, and ankles, then we want to remove the shoes. We want to make the uh, training atmosphere as challenging as possible. So when we put our shoes back on and we actually lace them up and get on the court, it'll seem much easier by default. We'll do the exact same two exercises there, once with eyes open and then just close eyes. So just do about five seconds of each. Looking good. Got knee up, toes to nose. Then we'll add the eye close component. That's perfect. Beautiful. 
as a basketball player, you are in a lunge position a lot more often than you probably think. And almost every single movement that you do on offense or in defense, in some way, shape, or form, is a version of a lunge. So we wanna make sure we have great balance out of a lunge position. It's also important that you know that as a player, you're going through all three planes of motion when you're playing the game. You do some things front to back, you do some things side to side, and you do almost everything with some type of rotation. So the next thing we'll do, and we'll just keep shoes off to heighten the, the, the level of difficulty, we'll get in a lunge position, and you're gonna freeze and hold this lunge, and we'll take the plate, and we're gonna reach the plate down, and then reach the plate up. And we'll just get three repetitions now, but we would be shooting for eight to 10 repetitions if we were doing this for a real workout. Front foot is flat, looking good. Yep, reach down and then reach up. Excellent. So this is a balance component. It's a stability component. Just get three reps and then go ahead and switch sides. That looks terrific. We don't need to do it for the video, but we could also do this with eyes closed. Eyes closed, barefoot is gonna be the highest level of difficulty for anything balance oriented that we do. Excellent. The next one we'll do, we'll get down in that same position. And this time we'll hold the plate or med ball or basketball overhead. And we're simply gonna sway side to side. So we're changing, trying to keep our center of mass and center of gravity stable, but we're gonna get as much sway in the core as possible. You can keep eyes open the whole time. Excellent. Beautiful. And the last one we'll do from this lunge position, arm straight out, is we're gonna get a 180 degree twist. Trying to keep your head and shoulders locked into one position so that your head and eyes move with the plate. Yep, that's okay. These are really, really challenging to do, especially with no shoes on. And these are just a couple examples of some things you can do to improve your balance. As you can see, you can do them just about anywhere. I mean, you could even do these in your bedroom if you needed to. Uh, remember that we have shoes on with no weight, eyes open is the base level. And anytime you're looking to progress and make things more challenging or difficult, we can remove sight, one of our senses. We can remove shoes, which will eliminate some of the stability. And we can add an external resistance like a plate or a ball. Uh, if you incorporate these into what you do on a regular basis, this could be part of your warm up and prep work, could be something you do post workout, but it will make sure that you are uh, with purpose and intention improving your balance as a basketball player. Hey guys, it's Coach Allen with the Elite Jump Training Program and I wanna share with you some of my favorite upper body strength exercises that only use body weight. I'm gonna show you a few variations of a standard push-up and a few variations of a standard pull-up so you can strengthen your upper body. One of the things that makes our philosophy so unique and so different is that we train the upper body because we know how important it is to not only your vertical jump, but also to being the best player that you're capable of. So our first level will simply be a standard push-up. Well, the player will get down in push-up position you're gonna have your hands directly under your shoulders. Lower yourself under control and drive up through the top. Yep, let's get eight perfect reps. That looks great. Keeping everything in the core tight. That's excellent. The next variation of the push-up would be to create an unstable environment for one side. So we're gonna take the medicine ball and put it under his right arm and we're gonna get four uneven push-ups and then we'll put the ball on the other side and get four on that side. So go ahead and grab the med ball. Still going for eight reps. Yep. Nice. Excellent. And our last variation will be the same thing, except we'll alternate the ball in between each rep. So we'll do an uneven push up on the right, roll it over, une uneven push up on the left. We'll go back and forth for eight reps. Yep. 
Excellent. Well, that's terrific. Excellent job. Now that we've worked the pushing side, our pushing muscles, which is gonna be the front side of our body, we need to make sure that we have balance and we work the back side of our body. So now we need to work on pulls. And any type of pull up or row is an excellent way to work the posterior side of the body. The first one we'll do is actually a modification from a normal pull up, and that would simply be a row. So we're gonna grab the barbell. Let's put it right in here. And you're gonna climb underneath there. We'll take an underhand grip. Yep, just like that. Yep, pull that chest, make it touch your chest to the bar. There you go, that's perfect. Let's see if we can get eight. Excellent. That's perfect. Beautiful. Excellent, nice job. If you have trouble doing standard pull-ups by yourself, that is a great alternative to be able to do a row. And depending on where you put your feet, he had his feet fully extended, which makes it very challenging. You can also walk your feet in to lessen your body weight and to make it uh, more reasonable for you to do. The next one we'll do will actually be a standard pull-up. So we'll just come in here, we'll grab the neutral grip, and we'll pull straight up facing in this direction. Yep, excellent. See if we can get four total. Excellent. As you can see, pull-ups are, pull are really challenging, especially if you have really long arms. The last one we'll do would be called an L pull-up. So we're gonna be in the pull-up position, but the player's gonna raise his legs straight in front so his body's at a 90 degree angle, and this time we're activating a tremendous amount of core. This is an incredibly difficult and very advanced. And those are variations of our push-ups and our pull-ups to help you build tremendous upper body strength. Hey guys, it's Coach Allen with the Elite Jump Training Program. Uh, and I get lots of inquiries about what you guys should be doing on your day off. Uh, first and foremost, it is important that you do take a day off because the only way your body can fully recover and build itself back stronger is if you give it time to rest and to recover. So what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna give you a few different exercises that for the most part, you can't do too much of. You can do these multiple times a day. You can do these on your day off. The first will simply be a cobra stretch. You're gonna go ahead and lay down in a push-up position and let your hips stay on the ground and then you're just gonna push up and extend your arms till your arms are fully straight. So we're getting here to lengthen the quads, lengthen the hip flexors. It's a great release of the lower back. And you can do these for time. You can move your sight so he can look up, he can look to the side. And great for lengthening again the hip flexors and the core. All right, you can hop up, excellent. The next one we'll do, this one will be simply for some proprioception, to making sure that all of our muscles are firing and it's also gonna work on our balance. We're gonna get in a split squat or a lunge position and the back knee will be about three inches off the ground and we're just gonna cross our arms, but then what's gonna make this challenging is he's gonna close his eyes. That way we really get that proprioceptive effect. So why don't you just do that and just count quietly to yourself to about 15 and then you can switch to the other side. Eyes closed, excellent. Excellent. That's perfect. And the last one we'll do, we can call the pretzel, and it's one of the best stretches that you can do. So you're gonna go ahead and lie on your back. I'll talk you through it. 
Now lie to one side, so once you flip over to this side, you're going to put this knee on the ground here and you're going to pull this quad back, so you're gonna to try to grab there and you're gonna to try to lower that shoulder to the ground. Yes, so we're getting a tremendous stretch in the hips and core, we're getting a hip flexor stretch and this is stretching just about everything you've got and you can actually do reps. You can try to lower that shoulder and then bring it up. There you go, just like that. Oh, that's perfect. Let's see if we can get four of those and then we'll switch sides and do the same thing, mirror image. Excellent, boy, that's perfect. Same thing, other side, yep. Bottom leg comes up to your butt, yes, perfect. Try to get that knee to the ground, yeah, there you go. And open those, there you go, open those shoulders. That's perfect. Nice job. So those are three exercises, or in many cases, kind of stretches and proprioception drills that you can do on your day off to make sure that you're performing at the highest level possible. Today we're going to bring you footwork secrets from Kobe Bryant. Even though Kobe's retired, he's out of the game, he says he's not missing it, he's still one of the greatest players of all time for any player of any position to watch and try to emulate as far as footwork into scoring, into passing, using the pivot feet to create angles, to create separations, to create scoring opportunities both for himself and for his teammate. Whether it's getting in, shot faking and back pivoting, using the step through, if you just do a quick search of Kobe footwork, it's a thing of beauty watching what he was able to do with his feet once he picked up the ball. A lot of coaches will tell you, if you picked up the ball, if you don't make a decision in a very quick split second, either getting the ball or getting a shot, you're dead and you need to get rid of it. If you watch Kobe, he shows you that with great footwork, you can still be an effective player and an effective scorer using your body and using your feet. So as we go through this series, whether you're a shooting guard, a point guard, or even if you're a big man who's watching this series, watch the footwork, add it to your game. And I promise you, if you get in the paint, if you get 10 feet and in, if you master these footwork separation secrets, you're gonna be a whole lot more efficient in your moves. Our first secret is gonna be how Kobe is able to manipulate his pivot feet. A lot of times when guys attack, they always come to a right left or a left right. In some situations, that's completely fine. But what Kobe would do in a lot of situations is he would go and drop. And as he would drop, he would dribble as that left foot hit the ground. So if I'm here, I drop, boom, and now I have either pivot foot. So he could shake and come back on that right foot pivot foot. Or again, he took that dribble, he could shake and come back on that left foot pivot foot. So what he does is he's, again, able to manipulate his pivot feet. Now he would do that from the mid post, from the low post. You can also do it as you attack from the wing. So if you're a point guard and you're attacking to the paint, if you get here and get into that spin move and boom, pop and both feet hit at the same time, you can go either direction to get into your shots. The key is the ball has to hit at the same time as your feet. If I go right, pick up, drop left, I've established that right foot. I'm dropping, both feet are established, and I can go either way. The more times you're able to get in positions where both feet are established as pivot feet, where you can use either one, the more options you're gonna have. Especially if you're able to get into the paint using that footwork. Our second Kobe secret is gonna be his ability to use the back pivot while always keeping the shot. With our first move, there's one disadvantage, and if you're an elite player, I'm sure you pointed it out. If he gets to this spot and has space, he wants to shoot the ball. So if I immediately get into my drop, I've given up that first shot option. Kobe's openly said that one of the things he tried to take from Jordan was to always keep the first shot option. So if you break down their footage, you see that rarely did Michael Jordan come shot fake and then get into footwork. He usually always got in that back to the basket position. Kobe took it, he emulated it, he made it his own. So while most say they're carbon copies of one another, that's something that Kobe may do a little bit better. So in keeping that first shot option, let's say he's attacking from right to left. If he goes right and left and he gives that shot fake, he can step through. Or what made him famous was his back pivot where he would seal the defense on his back. Again, the key though and the secret to this is that he keeps that initial shot option so he can shoot it at any point. 
if he has space, if he gets to his spot before the defense, he wants to be able to rise and get into it. If he can't, then he again has step through, he's got his back pivot, he has all sorts of scoring options, but he never gave up that first shot option. So instead of just step through and back pivot, two options, he has shot one, step through two, back pivot three, three initial scoring options out of the one move. Our third Kobe footwork secret is what we call the pound pivot. If I break this down very, very simply and I was attacking to the rim, again, as simple as you can possibly think, I'm just running left, right, left, right as I get to the rim to the finish. In a pound pivot, one of Kobe's signature moves, he never stopped until he'd already picked up the ball. And what I mean by that is he would be left, right, left, stop. He again would establish both feet as a pivot foot, but what he would often do was come back into a turnaround. Now we call that a pound pivot because it's not a spin move. It's not a rondo fake where I step. We're literally attacking downhill and as I step to the rim, pound, and then I pivot back to my shot. You could do that attacking midline. You could do it attacking down the lane line where again I'm pound, pivot, straight back into my shot. But the key is you're not slowing down until you've already stopped. So if you can imagine if there was a defense on my hip, they're running with, running rush, running with, boom, pound. They're going downhill, and I can come back. If you are very elite and efficient with your footwork, again, as we said, you've established both as your pivot feet, you can fake back and then step through to the rim as a counter. Bringing all the Kobe secrets together, showing you one move, but with establishing both, that one move becomes many. Now our last Kobe footwork secret we're gonna call the directional pound pivot. Where you can use that same move we just worked on and if I'm attacking and I change direction, my next step would then be exploding by with my inside foot. But instead of exploding by, if that defense cuts me off, my next dribble is gonna be at and then straight back away. So I'm changing, so I'm changing my direction and if I'm through, I'm one, two, three into my shot. A lot of times when we work on moves and counters, if this was taken away, the only counter that's taught or that we'll work on is a crossover or a counter back in the opposite direction. I want to be good enough and I want, I want you to be good enough to where if the defense cuts you off, you can counter back to the rim or you can counter away. A counter isn't always in the same direction that you're going. A counter is a reaction to the defense that puts you in a position to score. So I'm downhill, it's taken away, pound pivot, and I'm away with the directional pound pivot. In this segment, I wanna to talk to you guys about breaking down your defender. It sounds easier said than done. However, I feel like with some of these simple steps that you guys follow and work on, it could allow you to be able to blow by this defender regardless of your, your athleticism. All it is really primarily focusing on is your change of speeds and just being a little bit more deceptive with your footwork. I'll show you what I mean. All right, so in this case, depending on where you're at on the floor, whether it's in the slot or on the wing, maintaining a comfortable amount of space between you, you and this defender is gonna enable you to make the right reads. This game is all predicated off of making good decisions. So similar to how you may read a book at a, at a comfortable position, it's the same way we gotta get to with this defender and try to be able to make a, a comfortable read. So what I mean by that is typically if you have a defender in a stance, we'll start off with space and you'll walk into this defender's real estate and you're getting a little bit too close. By doing so, that allows him to be able to feel your tendencies on which direction you're going, giving him the advantage. So what I like to teach my guys is just how you would read a book, we gotta set this defender up and, and work on in a nice, nice, comfortable position. So if I'm too close, I can simply just retreat dribble, drag him up, and now I'm gonna go ahead and wind him up into my setup move. So you'll see a lot of players like James Harden use this by just taking little short choppy steps and gradually uh, closing this gap between him and this defender. So now what we'll do is we'll kind of step, step, and I'll just nicely just give a little stutter step to my left. If he bites on it, and his nose is aligned with my nose, I automatically know that I could attack his lead foot by just simply dropping up my foot and uh, attacking right through his hips, 
being able to burst through that contact, get a reach in foul, blocking foul, or best case scenario, get to the spot I need to for a pull up or a penetrate kick. So comfortable space, slowly step, shift them up. Okay, quick blow by. Now I can go right into my finish. All right, let's try it. Okay, so slowly walk up, step, slow, 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 good. Shift me up, good, there you go. Good, blow by, good. Now as soon as you see that defender drop a step, all right, and you shift him and he cuts that line, takes that line away, we wanna go ahead and open him up, expose his hips and get right through that, through that contact. Drop, good, walk me, walk me up, inside. Step, step, good, there you go, good, inside. Okay, so we have to really be focusing on our steps. Our footwork is everything on this. Step, step, up. We just slightly want to get that defender off balance. What this is going to enable you to do is this is going to create an angle for you to attack. So as I'm walking in a straight line, right before I get to my, my kill zone, I want to shift them just a tad. And typically, your guideline will be this right foot to his right foot. You'll be able to see this line, now you could accelerate, take the line, expose through the contact, and turn the corner. Okay, in this next drill, we wanna go ahead and try to piggyback off that, that last move we just did, and being able to now attack slowly in a vertical position, but bounce off to a retreat dribble, but moving that defender a little bit more laterally. So just to give you guys a visual, anytime I can, I wanna try to walk him down, and I just wanna see if he's willing to go back. As I step towards him, he should be going back. Now, in this instance, I can kind of go in the misdirection. So dropping this ball through, bouncing out. As I bounce off and go back north, that's forcing this defender to bite. He knows that I could shoot. So if I see him step up on this, I'm gonna keep my dribble active. Now I'm able to turn the corner, break the defense down and make a play. So in live action, we're gonna go ahead and step, step, bounce off, he reads, Quick blow by, quick shot. Let's do that again. Okay, vertically go at him. Okay, bounce off, create the space. Keep your feet moving right into the flow of your shot. Okay, let's try it. Good, walk me down, walk me down. Up, good, bounce off. Good, keep the feet moving, great job, great job. Good, walk, walk. Good, bounce off, good, up, good. Inside, good, read, read, read. Good, up. Perfect, perfect, great job. Now, it is a unique art and a unique gift to be able to break down that primary defender. First and foremost, you have to get over that fear of making a mistake. I know in the heat of a game, especially while you got a, a coach or whoever may be yelling at you, you have to get over that fear of making mistakes. One of the best things you can do in the, in the early in a game is catch and go. Especially if you're on the wing, as soon as you touch the ball, catch, strike through, get to your spots, and allow your game to come to yourself. You always have to take what the defense gives you, and on that biggest note, make sure that you're shifting that defender out of his stance, change your speeds, and hopefully you'll be able to make the right reaction and be able to get to that second or third line of the defense and make your play. It's very important as a young player to understand the importance of your footwork foundation and not always going full speed to the point that you don't master your footwork. A house without a strong foundation can't be built very high and your game is the exact same way where everything starts with the feet. If there's a move that you've just learned, you just picked it up from an NBA player and you try to go implement it in a game, it may be very difficult for you to find success. Even with high level players, if we're adding a move to their arsenal, we're gonna work on it very slow first. If we're working on a drag to drop and go, where we attack, drag, back, drop and explode out, we might go 50, 60, 70 times at only 20%. So we master that before we speed it up. So if we're working on that move, we're not immediately gonna have them just go drag, drop, and explode out. We're gonna have them build to that. We're gonna make sure that foundation is very, very strong. We don't want players to be able to do it one time in a workout. We don't wanna have them do it right once. We wanna have them do it right until they can't do it wrong. So if we were working on the drag and go, Coach and I are gonna work on it, and notice how, even though we can both do the move at full speed, we're building to that. We're working slowly, where we drag, boom, and we go. Drag, boom, and we go. Drag, slow, and we go. 
we explode out. But with that drag, we were slow. We make sure we came to square, we can get a shot. And then we scissored and exploded out. If you're adding a new move, don't forget the foundation. Build from the feet, start slow before you go to full speed. Hey guys, Coach Tim here. Today I want to really walk you guys through about reading your progressions, coming off of ball screens, and knowing what targets to hit, what to look for in terms of your options. What I like to teach my guys is to always give yourself at least three to four options when you come off a ball screen, just so you can always be effective and make the right reads. So I'll walk you what I mean by that. So the first step that I'm very big on is you have to learn how to be vocal. That's obviously number one. The second thing is learn how to delegate. So spacing in, off of pick and roll is extremely important. It's, it's vital, it's everything off of pick and roll because what, what you wanna do is you wanna create a tag situation. And, and I'll showcase that here in just a second, but we wanna force this big man to draw the defense, suck in the defense to where now, if, I, if they take away my option in terms of hitting the big on the roll or the pop, I still have another option to be able to skip pass or hit the snap up for the guy in the corner. So in this situation, I have my four teammates here. One technique or drill that I like to do with a lot of my guards is I'll go ahead and I'll keep everybody inside the paint and I'll force the guy that has the ball to go ahead and delegate and get guys in spots where they need to be to, to be able to have all their options while they come off a ball screen. So in this case, if I start here in the slot, I'll go ahead and I'll delegate. So I'll start working on uh, just pointing to a certain player. Hey, corner, let's go corner, corner, let's go opposite corner. Give me a screen right here, screen right here. All right, and from this example, what I'm gonna do, staying with my principles, okay? The first option coming off a ball screen is always look to drive or score. Whether it's coming off to, to shoot, whether it's coming off to get to the nail at the free throw line to get a floater mid-range pull up, whatever the defense gives you, it's important that when you come off this screen, you have a little bit of pace, but you're also looking to be aggressive by looking how to get inside the paint. That's gonna free up hopefully allow the defense to collapse and give you some options in case you can't get the shot on. So first option in your progression read will go ahead and be just coming off and looking to score. The second option is obviously with the big man that you're utilizing. If he decides to go ahead and roll, I'm trying to see if I can seam this ball through this tight window to be able to hit him to where now he could have an option to score. Or if the low man on this weak side rotation goes to help, all right, what we like to call as a hockey assist to where now he catches and he snaps it across for the hard skip pass. So you'll see a lot of great teams that, like your, your Golden State Warriors, San Antonio Spurs, they'll use this almost as a decoy off this pick and roll to get the big, the ball, and being able to skip to the pass to create long distance closeouts. So the third option that I always like to tell guys is obviously always going to our strong side kickout. So in this case, if I have a big that rolls when I come off, I'm just trying to draw a help side. So I got option one for the shot, option two is for this big. The third option is obviously this guy in the nail. If I could draw this defender, I want to go ahead and just kick for the penetrate kick. And now that's going to allow him to have a few options with the shot or the, just the catch and go straight to the rim. Okay, our fourth option, if I'm in a strong setting, let's say they're flat, I got two guys in the corner, the timing of this is extremely important that when I come off this ball screen and I got my big to roll, I got option one, the shot, two, hitting the big, I got three right here to my strong side kick, or I have the snap up with this guy on the strong side, he's snapping up to replace me to where I could go right here and go over the top with that, okay? So we'll go ahead and we'll go through all four aspects that hopefully will allow you to make the right reads and just being um, be able to have a great understanding of where you need to go with the ball and what to look for as soon as you come off. Okay, the first option off, off any ball screen is for you to look to score. So I'm coming off, get to my spot, raise up, quick pull up. The second option is always gonna have a little bit of pace coming off this ball screen. So now I come off, I glide, hit him with a pocket pass, nice little assist off that. Okay, going into our third option, all right, it's always off the penetrate kick. We're just trying to draw the help side. Defender at the nail, boom, right here. He's catching, going up for the shot, okay? And our last set 
The fourth option in the pick and roll series is very critical that you're on the same page with a strong side shooter. So we always want to make sure that he does not lift up until you see the big go ahead and dive because they'll have some confusion. If I come off this ball screen and he pops and he's already lifting up too early, we have two guys essentially in the same place. So we always want to maintain the importance of spacing and reading each other to where we're all moving at the same, same sequence. So now when I come off here, he rolls. I come up now, he reads it. I hit him and he's going straight up for the pull up. Those are four progression reads that anytime you come off a ball screen, the defense is essentially always gonna be set to give you one of the four. So make sure that you always get your defender off balance to create a two on one situation and maintain your reads by squaring your shoulders essentially while you come off the ball screen to increase your vision and being able to dissect the defense. Hey guys, this is Coach Damon. Today we're gonna to bring you three beginner reads coming off of a pin down. Now when we say beginner, a lot of time guys think, well, I'm an advanced player, I'm in high school, or I'm in, I'm in college. But if you can make these three reads correctly, it doesn't matter what level you play. You watch the highest level guys, high level, high major division one players and NBA guys, these same reads they're making over and over and over again in games. You watch Clay Thompson, JJ Riddick, Kyle Korver, guys who are coming off of pin downs and it's curl, straight cut and flare over and over again. But it's not just knowing what those cuts are, it's knowing when that read happens and how to react to it in a game. So our first read we're gonna go over is gonna be a curl. Now if coach is on offense and we've got this tight pin down being set, if I lock and trail on his outside hip, so if I'm here, I'm obviously giving up space to the middle of the court. So we're gonna assume that the hedge man or the man guarding the screener is locked pretty tight and he's not doing any type of hedging or taking anything away. But if I lock and trail on that outside hip, if he tries to go to the corner or if he straight cuts, that's gonna be taken away. But if he curls tight, there's no way for me to get through this space. Now notice as he came off, he was tight where he was literally making contact with the screener's back. If there's any type of space and I'm a good defender, if I see that, I'm gonna step through that. So I lock and trail, I'm on his outside hip as a defender, but he's tight, ball's coming from the top of the key, and as tight as he is, there's no way I can get through. With no hedge, he's gonna have a lot of space to the middle of the court. Now obviously, if we think about where we're going here in a second, if I predetermine where I'm gonna go, if the defender comes high and he's already decided he's gonna curl, he's coming right into the space that I've taken. So it's not something that you can decide here. Once the game starts, it's something that you have to react to once the screen is set. Now our second read and cut is we're gonna call a straight cut. And as simple as that may sound, a lot of times basketball terminology, it's not crazy, it is exactly what it says, is if I'm here on his inside hip and I run straight into the screen, he doesn't have to curl, and if he did, I would be able to step right into it. If he flared, that's easy to get to, but the screen is gonna open him up straight to the wing, as the name implies, with the straight cut. A lot of times screens are set where, where your back and your butt are pointing, that's where the ideal position to catch the ball is. And with the straight cut, with me being on the hips inside hip and not really making him work, I'm here, I hit that screen, and then he's straight to the wing with a lot of space to work with. Now our third is gonna be a flare. We locked and trail and coach curled. When I was on his inside hip and I swam straight into the screen, he straight cut. Now this time I'm on his inside hip and when we get to the level of that screen, I'm gonna cheat and jump high trying to take away that curl or that straight cut. Now while the original intent of that screen is to create space here to the wing, since I've come high, he can now flare it to the corner and I'm gonna have to get through this screener again to take that shot away. Now notice when he came off, just like if he was going to straight cut or if he was going to curl, he was still extremely tight to that screen, given every indication that he was going to straight cut and curl. And then as soon as he saw me go high, when I went high, then he flared it to the corner. Now when you flare that to the corner, you want to make sure that you get to space. So if we walk through it kind of dummy live, he's not just taking one step away. When we're here and he explodes off, when he gets to that corner, that's a lot of space for me to cover in a closeout. So stay tight, cover space to the corner, never lose sight of the ball. Let's take a look at all three of them live. He's here, he curls tight, and finish. Great job, ball's here, he curls tight, make sure he's making contact. Same hand, same foot, inside hip, great feet, way to get square, great shot. 
Defenders on that inside hip, straight cuts, makes contact. Great shot. Now last one, if that defender jumps high, separation, ready to get squared up, and great shot. Again, these aren't cuts and these aren't reads that you can decide when you're underneath the basket. Just like when you make dribble moves, just when you decide when you're gonna shoot, it's a fluid reaction. And if you're able to make all three of these reads in the process of the game, you're gonna be very difficult to guard. Hey guys, it's Coach Damon. And today we're gonna to bring you five reads that all point guards must know. Obviously, if you're gonna be an elite point guard, you gotta be just like a quarterback on the court. And sometimes that may mean you need to score the ball or you have to be a lockdown defender. Or one night you may have to be a distributor and your main role may be to get other guys involved. But if you're truly an elite point guard, you take on all those roles and you would excel regardless of what the game may need. So today it's gonna to be you as a distributor and you getting to spots on the court and then knowing where, depending upon your offense, where your teammates are gonna be. And then when you get to those spots, getting the ball on time, on target to your teammates so that they can make plays and make shots. Now our first read is gonna be a simple penetrate and kick. When I attack down the lane line, I see help, and then my teammate fills to the corner. So as you can see, I've got a teammate here who's on the wing at a 45. And if I were to beat my man at the top of the key and I'm attacking down that lane line, if that chair is his defender, it's gonna to have to help over. And as it helps, he's gonna be able to fill to the corner. And as I kick to that spot, this defender's gonna be in recovery. And if we can keep a defense in recovery, they're gonna be off balance and we're gonna be facing closeouts. And the more closeouts we can create, our field goal percentages are gonna go up, we're gonna have more shots at the rim as we can attack those closeouts, and our offense is gonna be a whole lot more effective. And again, this is very simple and that it was created as, I attack, I get to the elbow, I see help, he fills, and I kick. Now one thing we wanna focus on on that pass is I wanna do as good a job as possible it's still staying square to the backboard. If I come here and I don't penetrate and my shoulders and my hips go straight to him, not only have I told everybody in the gym where the ball is going to, but I've given up the option to hesitate and attack the rim. If I'm able to stay square and then kick with my outside hand, nobody knows where the ball is going until it's left my hand. I still got that option to shoot or attack, and I'm more of a threat than if I sell out to this one spot. Let's take a look at it live. All right, attack it, see help, stay square. On time, on target, made shot. Now our first read is we penetrated, he filled to the corner. In some offenses, especially dribble drive, instead of starting high, guys may start low. So in this action, as I attack, I'm still gonna see help from his man. And when his man helps, instead of filling low, creating a lot of congestion with me, he's gonna kick up on the court. So he starts low and goes high is opposed, again, which is the opposite of what we did the first time. Our pass is again gonna be very important in that I wanna be able to stay square and either kick it up or pivot and hit. What I wanna try to avoid is leaving my feet and jumping to pass because chances are his man will have helped all the way to the lane line and if I leave my feet, it's gonna be a charge. So I attack it, I sharp stop, I kick, he makes the shot, starting low, filling high. Kicks up, made shot. Our third read is gonna be a baseline drive and drift, which is central to pretty much any offense from middle school all the way to high school. And in that read, if I attack baseline, on the weak side, I'm gonna have a teammate drift to that corner. Now, if you see where I started, I'm here at the 45, his defender who is two passes away is gonna have at least one and probably two feet in the paint. And we talk a lot about how as a guard, if I can get my feet into the paint, it's gonna draw the entire defense. So if I can beat my man, there's gonna be help. I can get to baseline, I'm gonna draw him because attention is gonna be drawn to me attacking the rim, which can often free up that drift pass all the way to the corner. Now several key aspects with this. Just like before, we wanna make sure that we don't leave our feet on this block, try to jump straight through the rim. We wanna get as much to the baseline as we possibly can. You'll see in a lot of European games and FIBA games, they're known for jumping and actually jumping out of bounds and throwing that wrap pass. That's a very high level pass to be able to jump one way and throw one handed. So what we want you to work on is being able to either come to two 
or come to a one-two on the baseline and still shielding the defense with your body and hitting with that outside hand as you attack. Baseline drive, baseline drift, shot in the corner. We're here, drive baseline. Big shot. Our third read was a baseline drive and drift. This time, let's say for example, it's a ball reversal and when I catch, that defense rotates, but they rotate at a bad angle, so I can still get that baseline drive. And on that weak side, I'm probably gonna have a drift. Whoever swung the ball to the top of the key will drift to that spot. But this guy's also gonna wanna move. And as he moves, he's gonna fill to the corner behind me. So when he fills there, his man will help down. And very similar to before, when we attack down this lane line, when I kick, everybody's gonna be drawn to me and he's gonna have a ton of space. At the very worst, He's going to be facing a very aggressive closeout that he can then attack either to the rim or a one dribble pull up. So I attack baseline, I get to this spot, I'm going to have the drift option, I'm going to have the fill option, but I guarantee you if you get to this spot, one of those will be wide open. Ball reversals here, we attack, outside hand, big shot. Our last read is going to be if we are again able to get to that third layer of defense where we beat one beat the help and have to get that third rotation, dictating to the big and then hopefully getting our own man a layup by penetrating deep into the paint. If I'm on the same side with my big man and I'm able to attack and get to that midline, everybody is going to come to me in their attempt to help and keep me from getting to the rim. If that does happen and his man steps up, I'm going to have an easy dump down to this spot. Now with that pass, there are several ways we can make it, but the last thing that I want to do is come here and try to throw a chest pass through all of these hands. My man, his man, everybody in the paint is gonna be very active. So if I can make a pocket pass and go straight across my body left to right, then I can get it to him for that finish. What I can also do, depending on what level we're playing, if we're at the high school or college level and he's an athletic big, I can get here and then with my left or right, throw high to hands where he goes up and finishes. But most important, I wanna stay away from throwing it through all these hands, and if you are at a high level, and let's say he's 6'10", I need to be careful not to throw that pass, what would be right to his knees. I attack, I draw the defense, I dump or throw high to hands, and we get a wide open layup because of my penetration and ability to find my teammates. As a point guard, there are countless reads that you're gonna have to be able to make. These five are central to pretty much any offense that you're gonna run from middle school all the way from the professional level. You're getting to spots that are high percentage spots for you to make shots, which means the defense is gonna rotate and be in recovery. And when they do that, you have to be good enough to find teammates and get them open shots. Great question. So. There's not a great way to do decision making one on zero unless you want to get, you know, tricky. You can definitely do it with one person and there's different ways to do it. So say you have your mom or dad and say they're not very athletic and so you're like, all right, well, how do I work on decision making when I have my parent where I know I could just beat them every time? Here's a way to do it. Say you're coming off a pin down, okay? Your dad or mom is passing you the ball. And what they do is, after they, as they pass the ball, right, on, like, right as they pass, they're yelling out A, B, or C. Not shoot, drive, or shot fake, but A, B, or C. And A is shoot, B is shot fake, and then shoot, and C is attack. Because then what you have to do is, not only do you have to hear the A, B, or C, but then you have to register what does A mean, what does B do, what does C do. Something like that is a way that could be done if you don't have the perfect scenario where you can just work on it live against realistic defenders. I do that all the time with guys, you know what I mean? Uh, I just, you put them in a situation where they have to really think, really think. Workouts, practicing, you know, getting better uh, is so rarely about what you do in practice and really what separates you uh, in anything you want to do is going to be the unrequired work and that's a big thing that I emphasize with our guys. It's the unrequired work that's going to ensure that you maximize what your potential is. We all have a potential level. We all have an expiration on, date on our basketball careers. The guys who push back, you know, basketball careers are like, yeah, it's like a jug of milk, right? You put it in the fridge, you know what I mean? At some point in time, that thing's gonna, it's gonna be bad, right? 
and you go to pour pour you know into your bowl of cereal right and you take a bite right of your fruity pebbles or whatever and that milk is sour so everybody's got an expiration date on their career in the game of basketball right the guys who push it back are the guys who are doing the unrequired work that's not asked of you right if you only show up to practice and that's the only time you work you might be the best player on your current team absolutely you very well may be but what you've done is you put a cap on where you can go and what you can be uh, because you're not doing the extra stuff right so uh, you know, when I was working for the Houston Rockets, I'd get to the Toyota Center at about 7 a.m., right? That's where they play the games. And who would roll in at about 7.30? This was last year. I didn't really know him at that point in time. Chris Paul, 7.30 every morning. The guy's there, 7.30. He's a Hall of Famer. He's already a Hall of Famer. He, doesn't, he could stop playing. He's already made all kinds of money. He's got, you know, wife, kids, family, and he's a family man, absolutely. But 7.30 every morning, there he is. Well, who's the second guy? that shows up in the gym. Well, it's James Harden, right? So there he is, 745, right? And they've got two kind of different ways they go about things, but I tell you this, they all are out there uh, doing this unrequired work. They don't, you don't just happen backwards into being or becoming as good as they are. Now, do they have some, you know, some genetic qualities that maybe separate them? Absolutely, for sure, right? But Chris Paul isn't that fast. He's certainly not that tall, that long, or that athletic. James Harden, He's not fast. He can get off the ground a little bit, but you know, shoot, if he stops working out for two or three weeks, he can gain a quick 10 pounds and be a fat guy pretty quick. You know what I mean? He knows that. So that's why you know, he's getting in there. He's on the treadmill. He's got like full sweats on, and he's hammering out a sweat before he takes the court. And every day, he does his work. He practices. And then after practice, he has his post-practice routine. Right? So all these things that come together, there's no coincidence why these guys are so good, why they are as good as they are. Uh, after I got done playing college, I was fortunate. I got to play eight years professionally. Uh, I played in the NBA Development League, uh, won a championship there, won a Euro Challenge Championship in Germany, played in Spain, Italy, Portugal, New Zealand, traveled the world playing. And nowhere ever I went was I, uh, you know, one of those genetic type freaks, right? I wasn't the 6'8 guy with the long arms who could jump out of the gym. That wasn't what I was, but I was a guy who just outworked people. And so I kept doing that and I kept staying with that. So Clint was, came into the arena last summer, right? And he's Swiss, and he's a funny guy, and he gets with that, and he says, I want to work on my touches, right? He wants to, the low post, I want to own the low post. Okay, no, Clint, we're not, forget about the low post. One of Mike D'Antoni's favorite sayings is, live by the post, die by the post. Akeem Olajuwon ain't walking through those doors, and it's a different style of game. So you know what we did with Clint? You can imagine this is the court. Let's say this is the basket right here. This is the lane. Put a chair right here in the deep corner area and put a chair right here in the high slot area. Clint stand at half court. I'd be right there, our other coach would be right there. Clint would sprint to the low chair, set the screen, spin out, we'd throw a lob, he'd dunk it. He'd sprint back to half court, come over to my chair, Set it, spin out, lob, dunk. We had chairs over there, we'd go to the other side. We'd do the same thing, we'd do it for 30 minutes. We'd shoot free throws. And he'd come and say, what do we do now? We do the same thing, again, for 30 more minutes. If you wanna make $90 million, all you need to do is screen, roll, catch lobs, get rebounds, block shots, that's it, right? What happened was I, I was working with a guy, a couple guys. One, day, his name is Robert Covington. The other's name is Tyler Johnson. So those were two guys who were undrafted who easily could have said, you know, dang, you know, I didn't make it. I didn't get drafted. Everybody has aspirations of that. And, um, you know, what next, right? Well, both of those guys continue to work. They both went to the NBA Development League. And then Tyler signed at that point in time, which was what would have been the largest contract for an undrafted uh, player in NBA history, $50 million. Well, then Robert Covington had to one-up him last year by signing a $62 million deal and making second team all defense. But what I can assure you of, right, is the same qualities that these guys demonstrated, uh, you know, in terms of work ethic, unrequired work, going the extra mile, and all those types of, you know, things that are cliched are the reasons why they are where they are because none of those guys, neither of them, have any sort of super separating physical, tangible ability that they just woke up with one morning, right? So they didn't happen, they didn't fall backwards to where they, where they were. They didn't get there uh, by accident. If you want to make $80 million, I know a guy named Ryan Anderson. 
He can barely walk and chew gum. He can, can defend his shadow, barely. His shadow sometimes is a little, whoa, you know what I mean? $80 million. All he's got to do is make about 80% when he's open, shoot 45% from the three-point line. The interesting thing about that, if you think about it, good three-point shooters shoot 40%. That means 60% of the time you miss, you fail, right? 60% of the time, right? Well, extremes. Make 45% of all your three-point shots, you might make $80 million one day. All right, that's all I got for you guys. Thank you for your time. Hey, uh, and I appreciate your guys' effort. I thought you guys did a great job. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Just basically do a full kind of analysis of yourself. The way you're going to do it is, I want you to write down your strengths, your weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Strengths are basically things you're good at. Weaknesses are the things you're not so good at. Opportunities are where are there opportunities that you can improve and grow and expand your game. And threats, what are things that can keep you off the court? So if, if, if you know, I, we can do this with anybody, but you know, a threat could be you're not good at defense so your coach doesn't trust you to put you out there. You're not able to handle pressure so your coach can't put you out there when the game's on the line. You can't make free throws so you can't play when it's crucial minutes, <clears throat> et cetera. So do a, uh, it's called a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Once you do that, then what I want you to do is make a list of all the things that you could work on and could kind of try to improve. Okay, so number one, self-analysis. Number two, SWOT analysis. Number three, list off all the potential things we can work on. Number four is I want you to rank those in order of importance. So basically ask yourself, if I could only get good at one thing this summer, what is the one thing that would make me grow the most out of all the things on your list? What's the most important thing? And then what's number two, what's number three? And list off your top three things. So for me, I was shorter. One of my weaknesses might have been low post moves, I was not good at those, that was a weakness, but that wouldn't help me as much as me making more shots or me doing, you know what I mean? So that's what you do. And then the, the last thing is easy. Five, create a plan to improve your priorities. An actual plan. So that doesn't mean like, like say uh, you know, your priorities are, you've gotta get better at uh, and be detailed, but say priority number one is finishing through contact. Priority number two is uh, being able to um, make more shots. And priority number three is um, being better at a triple threat. Then priority number one is the most important one. We're going to be able to finish through contact. So then what we need to do is list off all the moves that you know you could do. You need to work on the teaching points, like write down all the teaching points. All right, I gotta be on balance. I've gotta be better angles. I've gotta do that. Um, number three, you could also talk about what could prohibit you being good at finishing. Well, if I'm not strong enough, well, that means I gotta get in the weight room, so come up with a weight room program. All those things go into being a better finisher against contact. And then number two, making more shots. We'll go back to what we did earlier. Review your shot on film. What are the weaknesses? Is the ball spinning the right way? Is, are you leaning in a certain direction? Is, are there imbalances in your shot? Are you consistently pulling back your follow through? Are you consistently snapping at the, et cetera, et cetera? Break down to build up. And then you go through everything like that and come up with a comprehensive plan so that when you step foot in the gym, you know exactly what you need to work on and what you're doing instead of going to the gym and just saying like, all right, hopefully I get better at finishing today, or I'm gonna work on a couple of things with finishing today, but you don't know if it leads to your improvement. If you have kind of a, it's like a GPS. If you, if you use your GPS, if you go on Google Maps and you put in a, a destination, it tells you exactly how to get there. And if you get off the course, what does it do? It reroutes you to get back to there. You guys need to be your own GPS. If you guys wanna get good at finishing, that's the destination. Create the program, the plan to get there, and then have milestones so that if you get off course, it gets you back on, so you're constantly evaluating, are you on the path to get the results that you guys want? That right there will help you guys a ton when you guys are building your guys' programs this summer.
Okay, so well done. If you got through all of those videos, you are loaded with training techniques and you have everything that you need to really, really make some real improvements, not just keep your game sharp, but actually improve during this time that we're all locked at home. And uh, again, well done for going through all of that. If you do wanna take it to the next level, just a quick reminder, we have that $5 at home basketball training program. We wanted to make it affordable for everybody. So the link will be somewhere around this video. You can click on that and check out that program. Before we go, I wanted to let you in on what I think is a bit of a secret right now that nobody's talking about. It might be a little bit unpopular to even talk about, but as crazy as this situation has been, and in some cases as awful as this situation has been, there is a silver lining to this. There is a bright spot for certain players who are quick enough to take advantage of it. And that is simply the fact that most players are not gonna do anything during this time. They're gonna play 2K, they're gonna watch Netflix, they're gonna watch the news, and they're not going to be improving their game. And when the gyms open back up and when basketball comes back, which it will, um, those players are gonna be out of shape, they're gonna be rusty, and they're not gonna be ready to play at a high level. And the few rare players who take advantage of this time and really lock in are going to be able to rise to the top much more easily and much more effortlessly than ever before. In, in 20 years of playing and training players, I've never seen this opportunity available. So really, really take advantage of it. Um, you have all the tools that you need. We've got 21 videos here for you to train every skill in your game. And we've put together a full-blown training program for just five bucks, okay? So you really, do, uh, you really do have everything you need and there's no excuse not to lock in during this time and really, really make improvements in your game. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you're staying safe. I hope your family is well. Um, everybody's staying as, as calm and healthy as possible. And if you need anything at all, just let us know in the comments section below. We'll be checking back in and uh, reading those comments and hopefully getting back to you if we can. Okay, so again, stay safe. I hope you enjoyed this and we'll talk to you again soon.